Hey everyone, early voting starts Monday, but what issues are important to Houstonians when it comes to our new mayor? Plus, could we see a day where Houston is known for hydrogen instead of oil and gas? And what's being done to prevent a worker shortage in fields that provide key resources to Texans? Dynamic media personality Antrochelle Nova and Pulitzer Prize finalist Evan Mintz join me to talk about the big stories impacting H-Town. It's Friday, October 20th, 2023. I'm Raheel Ramzanali, and here's what Houston's talking about. Evan and Trichelle, welcome in. Happy Friday. Now, this week, I had a chance to go to the Houston Parks Board Luncheon, which is their big annual fundraiser, and it was a blast. I was with Brooke Lewis, who writes our awesome newsletter, Hey Houston, you know that by now. And we had a chance to hear from Mayor Sylvester Turner. We also had Chuck Sams, who is the one of the directors for the National Park Services, talking about how they're making parks more accessible on a national level. And it was just a great time. And there's so much being done by the Parks Board to make our city greener and filled with parks that are accessible to everyone. So I want to start with this one. What is your favorite park? Answer Shell. Come on. What's up? So look, my favorite park in Houston is the Thrill on the Hill, the Hill, the one with the Hill. Hermit Park. Hermit Park has always been my favorite because for all I remember my entire life until I started um, breaking out in highs as I was rolling down the hill for every time we had a field trip for every time we would just pop up there randomly we would roll down that hill on Herman Park and now I go there for some really dope concerts I love when they have the movie night in the theater and now I'm grown I'm bougie so I just sit in the seats now and so I feel like Herman has grown with me so that's why Herman Park will always be my favorite park Isn't that a part of every child's experience in Houston is when you go to the zoo and then you always go eat lunch at the hill and then you roll down the hill. That is a part of our childhood. Absolutely. And guess what you've just shown me right now? My child has been deprived. He has not been to the zoo and he has not rolled down the hill. I'm taking him this weekend. It has to happen. It has to happen. It has to happen. (laughs) How about you, Evan? (laughs) Well, you know, I I would say Herman Park because I just have such fond memories of going there my entire life. My mom taking me when I was little on the train. I proposed to my wife there. Uh, But to avoid the overlap, I'm going to go with Memorial Park. And something that I love about Memorial Park is we had this big old park. A bunch of the trees died in the 2011 drought. And we said, all right, let's change the park. And really without any controversy, we poured in a bunch of money from donors and totally revamped the park. We created a pond where there was no pond, and we created these land bridges where there were no land bridges, and we tore out all these trees that really shouldn't have been there. And it just is so beautiful now. It's amazing. And in contrast, look at a place like Zilker Park in Austin, which similarly is a big old park that really could use some revamping. It's in a state of disrepair. And Austin can't even fix their train up there. They can't do a single thing. Any little blade of grass that you try to touch up there sparks a whole controversy. We can't change it. That's what I love about Houston. We're willing to change it if it makes it better. We don't care. Let's just do it. And you just go through Memorial Park and it is amazing. Thank goodness we had the wherewithal to make that happen. I love that. Memorial Park is a big part of our city. You go jogging there. You can go and relax after a busy day. And the fact that they've turned it around and it's so beautiful and it continues to be one of the hot spots. It's great. But you better be looking good when you run there. You can't be showing up all messy, okay? <laughs> you better have your makeup on. You better be looking good. Your hair better be styled up because that's where you get seen, okay? Mm. It's like the hot target in the Galleria area. That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> <clears throat> Okay, for me, quickly, I just love McGovern Centennial Gardens. That's part of Herman Park Conservancy. So that's just my pick. I think that is the best place in Houston. You can go sit there. You can go round and round on the big hill and get to the top and just get beautiful views. But that place makes me happy. So that's my pick right there. All right, let's get to our biggest stories of the week. We start with you, Andrew Show. What do you got? Listen... (laughs) In Aldine ISD, there was a school bus fight that led to a girl's eye socket being broken. Do you hear me? Your eye socket being broken. This is a young lady in Aldine 
ISD, got in a fight with two boys. Check this out. A seventh grader at Drew Academy um, is facing charges after assaulting a girl on the bus ride home. Picture this young lady sitting on the bus her very first time riding the school bus home from school. Boys are throwing marbles in her hair. She turns around, stands up to them and says, stop throwing this at me. And the boy stands up, pull up his pants and say, what you going to do about it? She defends herself. Another gentleman, excuse me, not gentleman, another boy jumps in the fight. Bust this baby. I sock it out. Can you believe this? And now catch this, guys. She was involved. This young lady, seventh grade. In the seventh grade, you're what, 14, 15, right? Let's say 14, 15. Young lady. 14, 15 years old, fighting two boys because she defended herself from one because she they're saying uh, authorities are now saying only one boy is being charged because she was unable to defend herself from him. But because she was able to defend herself for the other one, it seems as a mutual brawl. I am livid. I am living. No mother wants to send their child home thinking, giving them some independence, sending them on the school bus system, thinking they're going to come home with a eye socket bus. She didn't even get to make it home. The bus driver pulled over to a gas station because they saw a comfortable car. And that's how this young lady got hit. The bus driver didn't stop the bus. The bus driver didn't stop it. Just pulled over so the children could get some help. I'm irritated, guys. I'm irritated. As you should be. I mean, this is a story where, yeah, as parents, you're like, hey, we trust the bus system to get our kids home safely. And things like this happen on buses, right? Like I rode buses when I was younger, but never females getting beat up. The fights were always between guys. And for two boys to jump a seventh grader because she was tired of them throwing marbles, that is just it's heartbreaking. But the next thing that breaks my heart and this is a problem as society that we need to overcome is nobody stepped in nobody. and no other kids stepped in. If you watch the video, which is really hard to watch, we see this in fights across our, our nation. Nobody steps in. Everybody just recording it. They want to get it to go viral. They want to put it up. They want to have, you know, that moment to say, I got this fight on tape. And sure, some might be recording because it's evidence, but I doubt it. So we need to, as a society, learn to step in. And you know what? It's also important to remind every parent listening, anybody listening as well, learn self-defense. Go Absolutely. take class. Make sure you are skilled in this. That's the first thing I've been you know, drilling with my older daughter is you got to learn how to fight because I don't trust Absolutely. the world. I trust you. I don't trust the world. You know, Raheel, another thing that this parent is asking for is why are there not bus attendants? Mm -hmm. And they're stating that the reason why they're not bus attendants because bus attendants are only for the special ed students. And, and that's only uh, to assist the driver with getting them on and off or if they have an episode. But have we not seen so many things happening on the school buses that uh, bus attendants are needed, right? I, I think you're spot on with that. I think that this is one of those places where it's obvious that when you have kids, you do need some adult supervision. I feel like that's a default sort of setting. And the fact that the schools just don't have the resources to make that happen is something mm -hmm. that we need to bring up. You know, this isn't just these individual behavior. It's a structural problem. Why don't the schools have the resources they need to stop this from happening in the first place? Mm -hmm. It comes down to resources, right? Mm -hmm. You're going to have to hire somebody else. You're going to have to find these people. Mm -hmm. the ISDs are having a hard time finding people to work for them as well. And I will counter with this. Think about how many bus rides, how many buses are transporting how many kids, right? Okay. Hundreds of thousands of kids. And how many incidents do we have, at least that are captured or mm -hmm. reported on, right? So for the most part, it goes smoothly. But an incident like this makes you rethink everything that we just talked about. Absolutely. It's terrible. No, I think you're right. They don't report on the planes that land. They only report on the planes that crash. Ooh, that's a good one. Evan, what's your biggest story of the week? Oh, my biggest story of the week is the news that Houston has landed a federal hydrogen hub. We have got the Gulf Coast 
hub, which will receive more than $1 billion in federal funding to help spark the hydrogen industry. Now, this is great news for Houston, and I want to give credit to the Center for Houston's Future, which really conceived of this and started this. And it shows how Houston can lead in the energy transition. You know, when you're talking about wind, you're talking about solar, you're talking about battery, that's great stuff. And we have a lot of it in Texas, but the research really isn't here. The development isn't here. The corporate headquarters are here. But with hydrogen, which uses either natural gas or electrolysis from clean energy, it is a store of power where we have expertise here in Houston. We have the engineers, we have the pipelines, we have the infrastructure. And so if you're worried about Houston losing out on the clean energy transition as we get away from oil and gas, investing in hydrogen and as a path forward is the way that keeps us relevant and keeps us on the forefront. So as someone who wants to see Houston grow and thrive and survive, I am so happy we got this, especially given that we lost out on the ARPA-H headquarters, a new federal investment in health and research. And that went to Dallas not Houston. Mm. So I am been pissed about that. Uh, Houston really lost out, even though Rice University got a grant out of it. But I'm just thinking, you know, 30 years from now, 40 years from now, 50 years from now, when oil and gas isn't what it used to be, what is driving that Houston economy? We've got to start making the investments today. So two things on this, Evan. Number one, I'm going to make a joke, right, before I get to the serious question. Can you imagine 30 years from now, our baseball team is called the Houston Hydrogens, right, because we are the hub for hydrogen energy? Number two, in the short term, what exactly will this hydrogen energy be used for? What is going to, which industries will it impact? Well, the hope is that hydrogen really can be used to help decarbonize a lot of the high intensity industries where renewables or batteries just don't work. Steel production, concrete production, maybe large form transportation like ships and planes. Like we're really trying to figure it out, but we know that there's opportunity there. And so you need to start doing the base level research today so that we can have the payoffs later. And I've got to tell you, for years, NASA has been using hydrogen fuel cells. Uh, car companies like Toyota have been looking into hydrogen fuel cells. And so clearly there's something there, but you've just got to get that breakthrough or scale up to a place where it makes financial sense. And we're not quite there yet, but we're getting there. I like it. The Houston Hydrogens. I don't know. It, it just has a nice ring. Maybe it's a new uh, football team. I, I don't know what it is, but so maybe it's just our new mascot, the Houston Hydrogens. I like it. OK, so let me get to my biggest story. And this is going to kind of piggyback onto your most overlooked story as well, Evan. Crime is an important topic for voters as we near early election and voting day in Houston. Now, while crime is down from pandemic days, it's still higher than pre-pandemic days. And the second most important issue for voters, economic inequality. Concerns about crime was even more pronounced when respondents were asked to select their three most important issues. The top three were crime at 74 percent, road conditions and rising property taxes were at 47 and 36 percent, respectively. So it is something that we are all thinking about. And I know Crime is down, but it is something that is still impacting a lot of Houstonians. And the reason I want to bring up your most overlooked story, Evan, and we can just talk about both of these, early election days are starting. What? Yeah. Early voting. Oh, yeah. Early voting starts on Monday. Can you believe it? We're already there. It always grates me to see crime as considered a top issue, not because it's not important. It is. But crime is almost always listed as a top issue, and people's conception of crime is rarely connected to actual crime levels. It's more related to media coverage of crime. So if you look at long-term surveys, when crime is up, when crime is down, it doesn't matter. People think crime is higher than it actually is. And it's tough to craft good policy in response to crime, in response to violence, if people don't actually perceive what's really going on out there. But I've got to say, you get to have your voice for the next generation of leaders in Houston on Monday because early voting is beginning. You can go to harrisvotes.com and see all of the voting locations. You can vote at any of them across the city, which is great. There are also a bunch of down ballot things that I think are really important, not just state constitutional amendments, but Prop B, which is super important for Houston, which will enforce Houston to uh, negotiate 
with the Houston Galveston Area Council, which is the regional body that distributes federal transportation dollars. And Houston routinely gets screwed out of our fair share of dollars, whether it's after floods, whether it's for infrastructure, because the whole thing works kind of on a one municipality, one vote basis, rather than being weighted on population. And Houston is the gorilla in the room. But this doesn't just screw over Houston, it screws over Fort Bend, it screws over the unincorporated Harris County, and soon enough, it's going to screw over a growing Montgomery County. So Houston, by voting for this, you're going to make sure that we get our fair share of dollars and we don't get outvoted by like Liberty County on how federal transportation dollars should be spent. OK, so crime continues to be an important topic for voters as we near early election, which starts here on Monday. And of course, the election is coming up as well. And show any thoughts? Listen, I'm going to be honest with you, and I'm going to take it all the way back old school. Rock the vote, ladies and gentlemen. Your voice needs to be heard. Your voice, your vote is important. If you don't vote, shut up. Don't complain. All Mm. right? Don't complain. Go vote. By the way, the Houston Landing has a lot of resources and stories about what each candidate's platforms are, what other important issues are important to voters as well. So check that out. I've also linked that in the show notes. There's a lot of great information there. One last thing on this one, Evan. How do you feel about this election cycle? Do you think we've heard enough from the candidates? Do you think the topics and stories that are important to voters have been expressed by media outlets or just in general? You know, I've kind of been disappointed in the election so far. I remember when Sylvester Turner ran in 2015, and there really was a debate on the issues between him and Bill King and some of the other candidates about what to do about pensions, about what to prioritize, about how to deal with the budget. Uh, And this time around, it just kind of feels like it's on vibes. You know, it's on what team you're on. The Democrats want to go with Sheila Jackson Lee. Anyone who's more conservative wants to go with Whitmire. You know, and everyone else just kind of trickles throughout there. I really have been let down and we don't really get a sense of how each person will be as mayor and what it is they want to prioritize. And Shell, let's get to your most overlooked story. So listen, my most overlooked story of this week is the uh, residents of Pleasantville are concerned over repeated vandalism and now they're fighting back. Um, if you're not familiar with Pleasantville, um, there, Pleasantville is a historic black neighborhood in the Northeast Houston area, and they've had a rash of vandalism and dis- graffiti on their welcome signs, uh, as well as their stop signs, and they are just, they're over it. Now, Pleasantville is a neighborhood um, dated back to the 1940s, and these are the African Americans that have struggled uh, out of the World War II, right? And then they came through uh, with a developer, collaborated with Black Realtor Judson Robinson Sr. to develop a master plan community called Pleasantville. All right, we have overcome. Now here in 2023, for the first time ever, they are hit with vandalism, with racial slurs, very inappropriate things, their sign being knocked down, a couple of their signs even having bullet holes. And the residents are like, nah, we're not having this. Um, and they are taking over. They are very concerned on what exactly is happening in their neighborhood and why all of a sudden they're being targeted. So they just had a reunion event on October the 7th, and that's when they noticed that their Justin Robertson Park sign, it was defaced with black spray paint. That was their way to pay homage to the person who definitely helped develop this neighborhood. And now the community is standing up saying, listen, you may have messed up some signs. We ain't having this. And so I'm just kind of concerned. Um, and I don't really, when I brought this to my Overlook stories, one, I don't think people have noticed that this neighborhood was here. And now two, we need to do something about this because why in 2023, they've been here since the 1940s untouched. And now in 2023, they're all of a sudden getting hit with a lot of crime, well, not crime, this vandalism. What's up? Yeah, it makes no sense, right? Like, what are they, why are you vandalizing signs in Pleasantville, like anywhere, first of all, but why there? It's just a community that is trying to do their own thing. They are living and that's it. 
And like, what are we doing here? You know, I, I think there's always people who have, you know, hate in their hearts, who are bigots, who are racist. And we've done a good job over the past several decades of trying to shove them into the corners of society. But when you see things like leaders in the Texas Republican Party palling around with white supremacists like Nick Fuentes and defending it, it creates this permission structure where people say, oh, maybe I can get away with this now. Maybe I don't have to be ashamed of it. And they just look for opportunities to act out like that, to mess with people, to try to show that they are you know, proud of being racist. And I think it's time we all get together and shove them back into the dark corners. Mm-hmm. Now, Regina Richmond, a longtime Pleasantville resident said, it's 2023. We are a tight knit community. We're not standing for this. And she is rallying the neighborhood to come together. So vandalists, beware. One thing to note in the story, investigators said they are not currently looking into these incidents as hate crime, but they also haven't filed every incident to police because it's been difficult gathering evidence since not many residents have surveillance cameras and they haven't been able to identify any witnesses. So maybe we're just starting by putting some surveillance cameras in the neighborhood we can get some answers and we can find out what exactly is happening there. But guys, I think we all should take note. The fact that this neighborhood has been here for so long, untouched, and they don't even have surveillance cameras, that should let you know how safe they feel. Yeah, absolutely. That's a great point right there. I'm going to get to my most overlooked story. And this is something we don't think about, but we're now reaching that point in our labor force where a lot of people are going to start retiring and so many key services will be impacted. One of those major services that we take for granted, water. More than 30 percent of the water and waste workforce is going to retire by 2028, according to the Texas Tribune. Now, the state and agencies that are working with this service, they are taking proactive steps to prevent a major issue by offering provisional permits to high schoolers, courses in high school to get students ready, AC during hot days. But one thing they cannot combat is in rural areas. Kids that want to work there, well, they don't have malls, they don't have theaters, they don't have things to keep them there, and there's just no way to combat that. But look, this is something the state and agencies are thinking about, and I just wanted to bring this up because this is something that's going to impact a lot of us when the workforce nears retiring age. I think you're spot on. You've got this whole generation of boomers and Gen Xers who you know, got into these uh fields of labor and we haven't been training the the generation to replace them and they're not jobs that are particularly viewed as glamorous they're not particularly viewed as the sorts of things that people aspire to but i think that when we've got tight labor markets and opportunities to unionize then maybe you can say well it's not a pretty job but if it pays well it's a good job mm-hmm. my husband and i were just talking about that this this very thing this morning Remember when there was a time when we were sending uh, students to trade school and then all of a sudden people were like, nah, don't go to trade school, go to college. This is why trade school is important. This is why, because now who's going to run the water plants? Who's who's going to do this? These are very respectable jobs. These are very um, labor heavy jobs. Like you said, like they may not be glamorous, but this is a great honest living and you will be taken care of and you'll take care of your family as well. And I, I don't think people thought about this when it was this huge surge of everybody go to college or nothing. College is important, but trade schools and these type of labor jobs are also important because now what are we going to do? Jason Knobloch, the deputy executive director of Texas Rural Water Association, was quoted in this story by the Texas Tribune. And I'll just paraphrase what he said. And it's basically what you said, Andrew Shell, is that these jobs are not only important to you and your family, but also your community. And without these jobs guess what happens? The town kind of falls apart. So, and and he said that the youth are starting to understand this. So hopefully we do see a rise in workers for these services. All right, let's get to our moment of joy. And Trishel, let's start with you. What made you happy this week? Uh, When I tell you guys, uh, my only begotten son, Axel Nova's in kindergarten and killing it. He is smashing it, Hulk, smashing it. And no, I'm not surprised, but I am proud because everybody thinks their child is great. Everybody thinks their child is wonderful. But to have the school administration pull my husband and I to, to the side and say, yo, you got something special 
and we want to do something about it. They want to take him not one, but two grades up. What? That's crazy. Now, truth be told, and I have to have a full truth transparency moment. Yes, my son does need to be in the second grade. And I think people thought it was a flex when I would say, yeah, he's four years old reading on a third grade level doing first and second grade math, right? They thought I was just flexing. But to have it confirmed, it's like, yes, he's already tested out of kindergarten reading math and science, but I am in love with his kindergarten teacher and she has made it very clear, your child is doing well, but he is not mature enough to go. And I to her said, you are not lying on my child. I appreciate you for telling me. Let's develop a curriculum to where he can learn how to be a well-rounded individual. So I am so overjoyed right now to know that the educator that has been placed in my child's life is really, really, really educating him to be a great person. And she has the backing of the school administration, right, to uh, develop a curriculum that would be able to cater to my gifted child. So I am high-fiving and kudos to uh, my child's teacher, his progress, and that administration at his school. I love hearing that because we're hearing so many stories about the education system letting children down and parents down. We love hearing stories where they are stepping up and making sure that each child is taken care of and really catered to on a personal level. That's awesome. Good stuff there, Aunt Shell. Absolutely. And I think I've never, I've always been very vocal that this is why I was afraid to send him to school. So y'all know I was doing a lot of praying and crying, crying and praying. <laughs> <laughs> Even at Meet the Teacher, crying, crying and praying in his, over his classroom, over his teacher, because I was afraid of, oh my God, they're going to try to hold him back and hinder him and this and that. But it's totally different yeah. and the opposite. So high five. Evan, let's get to you. What is your moment of joy? Well, my moment of joy is that we finally reached that time of the year where I switch from morning cold brew to morning latte. It is cool <laughs> enough in the mornings. Every Saturday, every Sunday, I walk down to milk and cookies with my kid, Franklin. And over the whole summer, he said, Daddy, cold brew, donut. He wants his donut. I get my cold brew. But neither <laughs> correct him and say, no, 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 Daddy latte now. And I just <laughs> enjoy that moment of time. It is the changing of the seasons. We don't get the trees turning yellows and orange and reds in Houston. I just get a different coffee cup. Nice. I like it. Take full advantage of this cooler weather. I'm going to be taking full advantage of the cooler weather, and this is my moment of joy. My Texas Longhorns are coming to Houston finally to play U of H. Now, the Texas Longhorns have played Rice previously at NRG Stadium, but now we get to play the University of Houston, and we get to settle a lot of trash talking rivalry talk here between Cougars and Longhorns. Now, the Longhorns are only going to be in the Big 12 for this season before they head to the SEC and make that transition. So this might be the only time we see the Cougars and Longhorns play in a regular season game in our lifetime, unless they meet up in a bowl game, which could happen <laughs> down the road. But for right now, this game will not happen again in the regular season. I am telling you, it is not going to happen. It is happening this year, though, and I'm pumped. I'm taking my daughter out there. We're going to have a good time, and we're going to be cheering on our Longhorns. Although she loves mommy's Baylor Bears, but I'm still trying to brainwash her back to the Longhorns. So this is how we start. So I'm excited for that. And it's another marquee event for the city of Houston. A lot of people are going to be out there. It is a sold out game. So I can't wait to see everybody. It's going to be a good time. All right. Evan, Andrew Shell, thank you so much for joining us. That was a lot of fun. And we will talk to you down the road. All right. See ya. See y'all later. That was Andrew Shell Nova and Evan Mintz. You can read all of the stories we discussed in our show notes. That will do it for this week here on CityCast Houston. Our lead producer is Dina Kespa. Our producers are Natalie Rivera and Carly on Jones. Our newsletter editor is Brooke Lewis, and the host is me, Raheel Ramzanali. Our music is by the band All the Kimonos. We'll be back on Monday with a fresh episode. Thank you for listening, and I hope you learned something new. Sorry for the annoying throat clearing. That never sounds good on somebody else's headphones.